So welcome, everyone, to today's um, Diverse Diplomacy Leaders Speaker Series, featuring today an incredibly accomplished foreign policy leader, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. So for those of you who I don't know already, I'm Caroline Savage. I'm the Virginia and Dean Rusk Fellow at Georgetown's Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. And the idea for this series um, was spurred by a number of conversations that I've had with students um, throughout my time at Georgetown um, who've raised questions um, about you know, the challenges, the unique challenges um, and, and opportunities and or responsibilities of careers in diplomacy, particularly for women, um, for minorities, for first generation Americans, um, people with disabilities, and so on. So as part of the Institute for Study of Diplomacy's broader mandate to connect students with foreign policy professionals to better understand the opportunities and challenges of these careers, we've launched this series and we're extremely pleased to have Ambassador Thomas Greenfield join us today. Um, for those of you who don't already know the ambassador personally, uh, she retired in 2017 following a 35 year a distinguished career in the US Foreign Service. She's currently the first Distinguished Resident Fellow in African Studies at ISD. And before that, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield had reached really the highest levels of the Foreign Service. She served for four years as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, as well as Ambassador to Liberia prior to that. She was also the Director General of the Foreign Service with responsibility for human resources for all 70,000 State Department employees. Her resume, of course, is extremely rich and varied beyond that. Um, and she held a long line of very senior uh, positions, both in Washington and um, service overseas included postings to the US UN mission to Geneva, as well as in our embassies in Pakistan, Kenya, the Gambia, Nigeria, and Jamaica. I miss anything? <laughs> uh, <That's it. laughs> I know there's a lot in there. So thank you so much again for joining us today. And I have a number of questions, of course, myself um, to hopefully get us started off. And then I hope that we can open to a conversation with the broader group. So maybe to, to just get started. Sure. You've had such an amazing and varied career. I wonder if you might uh, think back to what initially attracted you to a career in the Foreign Service and what process led you to decide on pursuing this career? You know, my, uh, my process is a bit different from most of the people I've met in the Foreign Service because it was not my intention nor my goal to be in the Foreign Service. Uh, early on, uh, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a lawyer. And when I started college, that was what I was working toward. Uh, I ended up being uh, detoured uh, and encouraged to go to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin. Also uh, my alma mater. Yes. <laughs> so I was going to do that for one year, master's program, and then go back to law school. But another detour uh, happened, and that was an interest in Africa. That had been buried deep in, in, in my psyche from earlier experiences. Uh, but I became interested in Africa again uh, while I was in graduate school and decided I would uh, go forward and pursue a PhD in African studies at the University of Wisconsin. And that would take me to Liberia, where I uh, did research toward my uh, doctorate. And uh, I, for the first time, encountered people who were in the Foreign Service and started to engage with them, including one who would eventually become my husband. And that's how my interest started. I took the Foreign Service exam in Liberia in 1978, again, with no real intention of following through. Uh, I actually didn't think I passed the exam. I, I took it on, on to just go through the experience, um, passing the exam and then going through the oral process, but still at the same time pursuing my academic career. I uh, was in the process of writing my dissertation when I was encouraged to take a position teaching at Bucknell University. And that's when I realized at that point in my life, I hated teaching. And so in the meantime, the foreign service process was continuing. The relationship that I'd started in Liberia was developing. I got called to go into the foreign service. I got married. All of this happened in one year. And that's how I ended up in the Foreign Service. And I don't regret that decision. And I tell a lot of young people that you can have goals and you can have plans. 
and occasionally there will be an open door and you see that door. It's not your intention to go through that door, but you should see what's behind the door. Uh, open the door to see what's there. And that's how I ended up. I opened a door that I hadn't intended to go through. And I went through that door and my whole career has been a career in which doors have been left open and I poked my head in and ended up going someplace I hadn't intended to go. Fantastic. Um, I wonder if you might share with us any reflections. These questions of identity come up time and again um, from people starting their careers in the Foreign Service uh, to Georgetown students. I wonder if you might tell us sort of how you see yourself and how you think others see you in the foreign affairs world. And, Maybe think about sort of which ways, um, and I'm emphasizing the plural, you identify and how you think that's shaped your approach to your work and others' approach to you. You know, I think people see me differently from how I view myself. In the Foreign Service, I'm a Foreign Service officer. Uh, I am a career Foreign Service officer. I don't uh, carry uh, an identity card that says black woman. Uh, first generation from the South, uh, because those are other identities that I have, but they, for me, have not been the defining identities that I carry as a Foreign Service officer. And so as I moved up the ranks of, of the Foreign Service, I carried with me that rank, that title, uh, the position uh, that I was in. And sometimes I would walk in the room and somebody would identify me as a tall black woman uh, when I was on the visa line in, in, uh, in Jamaica. And the Jamaicans had funny ways of identifying people. So I was the black woman on the visa line. My Asian American colleague was the Chinese woman on the visa line. My red haired colleague was uh, red on the visa line. So we were all identified in different ways because of how people uh, viewed us on the visa line, but we all had one identity in common. We were consular officers, and that was, for me, the identifying uh, role, my identifying title uh, in that position. I never carried myself as the black woman in the Foreign Service. I do wonder if there were any points over the course of your career that you felt that any of your identities, um, you sort of point to, um, either internally or externally sort of um, put forward, entailed a feeling of any additional responsibility, advantages or disadvantages for that matter? You know, I, uh, when I talk to young people, and particularly young people who look like me, uh, young people who came from the same background that I came from, uh, relatively um, impoverished and, and somewhat hardship background uh, from the Deep South, uh, surviving uh, segregation and, and, and racism, uh, I think we all carry a burden. Uh, and that burden is a burden to succeed. Because I do think when other people look at us, they question our accomplishments based on our identity. So when I was at Louisiana State University, I felt the total obligation and burden to succeed because I knew that if I didn't succeed there, it was going to be because I was a black woman from a poor background and I should not have been there. I should have gone someplace else. So I felt this burden of, of, uh, of succeeding, uh, this burden of not being a failure because I worried that had I failed, that failure would have been uh, given to other people who look like me. And so I had to succeed for them. You sure did. <laughs> uh, every step of the way, it seems. Um, I wonder if you might also, sort of thinking back, um, reflect upon uh, over the course of your career, um, whether it, you know, the foreign affairs communities or the State Department's approach to a diverse and inclusive workforce has changed over time, whether it's improved or backslid whether there are any policies or programs or initiatives that you've seen um, actively support and encourage change. You know, when I came into the Foreign Service in 1982, uh, the State Department had two class action suits that were on the books and actively being pursued. There was a, the Palmer suit, the women's class action suit, and there was the black class, class action suit. Uh, the Walter Tom Thomas versus State Department suit. I wasn't the Thomas. There were, it was another Thomas. 
Uh, and so that was a little bit um, um, frightening to then a black woman coming into the Foreign Service because what it said to me is that there's discrimination against women and there's discrimination against blacks and I'm both of them. Uh, so how do I operate and, and succeed in this environment? Uh, both of those suits were settled uh, in favor of the plaintiffs. And uh, the State Department kind of moved on and there was the sense that they were dealing with issues of gender and they were dealing with issues of minorities not being given uh, the same privileges and the same rights as, as, as others. But I think what eventually ended up happening is that although these were not issues that were being discussed openly and and boldly, the issues were still there. There was a sense that uh, we still had um, uh, problems of inclusion uh, in the State Department. And I did see some improvements. I don't feel during my 35 year career in the State Department that I experienced any discrimination uh, directly that I was aware of because I was a woman or, or because I was black. I do know of other people who did uh, have those experiences. I think part of my experience was I don't own it. Uh, so my feeling was if someone has uh, negative feelings about me because of who I am, it's their problem. So I never own the problem. Uh, so because I never owned the problem, I guess I never really experienced it. I do have colleagues who experienced, they owned it and they experienced it. And it's not their fault. So I'm not saying because they owned it, they experienced it. But they did have those experiences that they felt held them, held them back. And I saw uh, some of my colleagues leave the Foreign Service, particularly uh, young women uh, who felt that the department was not inclusive enough for them. Uh, and then there were really, uh, I think, very sincere, uh, committed efforts by the department to address some of these issues. Uh, I was director general of the Foreign Service, and I certainly took this on uh, full force. Now I have young women and young African Americans coming to see me to say things have gone backward. And they are having uh, experiences that have made them question whether they want to continue in, in the State Department. And I probably have young people, probably one a week, um, over the course of, say, the past uh, six months, uh, who have come to me with some concerns about whether they, they could continue under the current environment that they are, are dealing with in, in the State Department. Of course, I'm encouraging them to stay uh, I, I think that uh, the situation that they're going through, uh, they have to be there, they have to be part of it, they have to challenge it, uh, and they have to make it better when the situation uh, gets better. And um, I, I had one young woman come to see me actually yesterday, and I decided to have a younger colleague speak to her because I, my, my response was, hang in there, girl. Uh, you can get through this. Uh, and you will be a better, stronger person if you get through it. And she, I could see on her face that this wasn't resonating with her. So I brought in a, another colleague and I said, you know, talk to someone who's more your age. And the other colleague said, get out. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to take this. You're bigger and you're better than this and you can do better than this and you need to move forward. So we kind of confused her. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but she, it, at least she got both sides of, of the story. So sort of jumping to I mean, the, your perspective from now, I wonder if there would be, um, with all of your experience in the Foreign Service and um, with the last um, couple of years changes, any steps institutionally that you might recommend to state or foreign affairs community writ large to improve the culture and opportunities for all people of all types to yeah. equitably succeed? You know, I, when I was director general, uh, one of the things that I thought would have made the State Department more attractive uh, to your generation and, and those um, below you, or uh, younger than you are, uh, is that we're, we become more flexible. Uh, most of your generation 
are not people who are going to stay in the same job for 35 years. Uh, uh, my generation prides itself on the fact that we could hang in, to, in there in the same job for 35 years. I, in the Foreign Service, you're changing, but you know, we commit for a lifetime. Uh, your generation wants a little more flexibility. Uh, you want to take time off, if you're a woman, uh, to have your children, or even if you are a man, to, to devote time to your family. You want to do development assignments. You want to take three years off and go to law school and come back to the State Department, or take a year off to go and, and work in a refugee camp, or do something different and then come back to the State Department. The State Department doesn't have the flexibility to, to allow you to do that. And so during my period as Director General and since, I have seen a large number of people leave because they didn't have the flexibility. Uh, again, for a woman, my generation was, and I, I laughed about this, I had an experience uh, young and uh, when I was much uh, younger. Uh, I was pregnant and I was trying to figure out how to uh, maneuver through uh, being pregnant and staying in the job and not having leave. And I asked for leave without pay and the system didn't allow it. And I jokingly said, I'm, I'm a superwoman. Uh, I can uh, have this baby on the visa line, uh, bite the um umbilical cord, tire <laughs> on my back and say, now why do you want to go to the United States? Uh, and that was how our generation thought. I joked about it, but it was how our generation thought that we could uh, make the bacon and bring it home and cook it too. Uh, that is not the case. And your generation, you, do, you don't even joke about it. Uh, it is not what you want to do. And so we have to adjust to that. We have to be flexible so that if you want to take a year off and stay at home, like some of my European colleagues, and be a full-time parent, then it's okay. And you can come back and take your career where you left it and move forward. Uh, how we build those flexibilities into the State Department is still a challenge for the department, but we have to figure out how to do it. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to be able to keep uh, the committed employees that we have now. Fully agreed. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, maybe I'll ask just one more question with your permission and then open up to the room. Uh, I know that um, they have their questions as well we want to make ample time for. Um, I wonder if you might tell us about some of your champions or mentors and how they influenced your careers and perhaps reflect as well on how you've paid this forward either at the State Department or at ISD or beyond. You know, I feel I, when I came into the Foreign Service and I, I, I didn't have mentors and I didn't have champions and I see the young people uh, we're dealing with in ISD and here at the university and you're meeting senior uh, uh, State Department officials at a very early stage in, in your careers. You're engaging with people who are doing the things that you want to do in the future. Uh, if you grow up in a small rural town in, in Louisiana and you go to uh, Louisiana State University uh, in, in Baton Rouge, you're not going to have the kinds of engagements that you students are uh, fortunate to have at, at this university. Uh, so I, I felt uh, very early in my career that I needed to make myself available to people outside of uh, Washington, uh, D.C. So from many years ago, whenever I'd go back to Louisiana, I always spoke at local high schools. I always spoke to even elementary school kids so that they can know that there's such a thing as a diplomat and, um, and there's the Foreign Service because I didn't know that when I was a little kid. Uh, so that they can decide, like some of my colleagues I've met here who told me I decided I wanted to be in the Foreign Service when I was in third grade. Well, I hadn't even heard of the Foreign Service when I was in, in high school. So I want to be the person to put that in the heads of young people. And that has been my first way of paying, paying forward, is making sure I'm available. Uh, my husband constantly reminds me that I'm overextended. My office reminds me that I'm overextended. 
uh, because if any young person contacts me, they send me an email, I will answer and I will see them. So I spend a lot of Saturday mornings having breakfast with young people who are interested in just hearing about my career or figuring out how they can pursue a career like this. Uh, if I'm invited to give a speech at a university, and I do a lot of speeches, if I'm you know, going to South Bend, Indiana, as I did a, a few weeks ago, I always ask that they arrange for me to do a high school uh, while I'm there. And if I can do a high school, if I can speak to high school students, I will, uh, I will do that. So that's one way I, I've, uh, I've paid it forward. And the other way, when I was Director General of the Foreign Service, uh, I got this reputation uh, from uh, my, uh, my staff who uh, were dealing with all kinds of issues. These are our, our career um, development and, and assistance officers. And they have the hard chore of trying to get um, a, a square pig in a round hole. Like, I got to get a person assigned to this position in the Gambia and nobody wants to go. So how do I entice this person to go there? And, and they don't look at the person sometimes. They don't look at the person's needs and the person's requirements while they're trying to figure out a way to fit this person in, into a, a position. I always try to get to know the person. And one of the uh, types of persons that I wanted to get to know were young women who were pregnant. Uh, who may have other issues that uh, are not taken into consideration because I was one of those young women. And the then Director General of the Foreign Service, Joan Clark, helped save me from myself because I decided that the State Department was not um, going to work for me uh, because they couldn't figure out how to deal with a young uh, mother, uh, not yet mother, uh, who had assignment needs, uh, including the need for leave without pay because she had just come into the Foreign Service and the system didn't allow leave without pay for uh, junior officers. So they literally couldn't figure out what to do with me. Uh, and I wasn't a leave abuser and I kept saying to them, I'm not a leave abuser, I just came into the Foreign Service and I'm going to have to take leave. And they couldn't figure it out. So I wrote to the Director General and she figured it out. And I met her and I was able to tell her that when I became director general. And so the CDOs never wanted to put in front of me anything that had to do with a young woman who was pregnant. And I got a couple which they recommended, you know, do not approve. And I would always approve. <laughs> or, or they would recommend that I approve their recommendation which was not to give, allow a, a young woman who wanted to telework uh, from uh, Monterey she had an office job uh, and she had a medical issue that required her to go back to the States and she didn't want to be curtailed. She wanted to go back to post and her CDOs wouldn't, couldn't figure out how to do that for her because we don't approve telework for people who are assigned overseas. And so uh, she put a request in to telework and I got the memo saying approve not approving her request and I disapproved their request that I not approve, and I approved her request. And this young woman is now the head of a, a, a consulate in Mexico. She didn't leave the Foreign Service. Uh, she, I think she's on her third child now. And, uh, and I feel like I paid that forward because Joan Clark saved me from leaving the Foreign Service. Thank so you that's for it. that, for all the women of the Foreign <laughs> Service, I thank you. And I think that uh, it's a very, it, it's a topic that's very close to my own heart. <laughs> I sure appreciate your advocacy through the many years. Um, well, maybe we should open up to the broader room. And I'd ask that uh, anyone who has a question, please sort of um, motion for the microphone so we can get your question um, on video as well. And please introduce yourself. I'm Chris Wagner with the School of Foreign Service, and I'm curious about why you did not want to go to the and join the uh, Foreign Service because you tried very hard to sort of avoid it. I actually didn't try to avoid it. I didn't know it existed. 
So I was, uh, as I said, I grew up in, in the rural South in a segregated community going to a segregated school and that kind of experience was not introduced to me. Uh, not even at the university level. I mean, I knew that we had diplomats overseas. I knew that there was a foreign service. I just didn't uh, conceptualize that it was available to someone like me. And it was only when I went overseas, I was 26 years old, that I started seeing uh, this as a possibility. Uh, but I'd already made up my mind that I wanted to be in academics. And, uh, but I went through that crack in the door and discovered that there were, uh, that this was an option. So I wasn't avoiding it. I just didn't know that it was possible. What other questions do you have? Please. Hello. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Linda, for your um, inspiring messages. Like you, you've always like inspired all of us, even like to me, an international like student. So my question is, oh, I'm Tipa. I'm a master student from Center for Latin American Studies, and I'm joining my country's foreign service very soon this summer. <laughs> I'm from Thailand. So my question is that, what do you think about um, being a diplomat? That we have to have our own maybe expertise, like specialization, but at at the same time we have to be general. It's kind of, we have to be on one hand generalist and then specialist at the same time. It's, it's like a contrast, like concept. So like, how do you think about that? And how do you like suggest that to manage that? Like being specialized and general at the same time? You Thank know, you. I, I think that's a special skill. And I think it's a skill that you should want. So coming into the Foreign Service, we all have to be generalists. You have to be flexible. You have to be prepared to do whatever is put uh, in front of you. But you also have to figure out how you stand out as a, uh, as a personal, as a person and as a professional. What is it that makes you special that people want you on, on, on their team? And for me, early in my career, it was working on refugee and humanitarian issues. And it became my expertise. Uh, while we had lots of other people who did this work, but they did this and then they moved on to something else, I decided that I was gonna own being a, a, a humanitarian and refugee specialist. And it got me a succession of about five jobs uh, and it helped me develop a reputation beyond being a, a person uh, working on refugee issues, but a person who showed compassion. Uh, a person, it gave me an opportunity to show who the real me was, uh, which is that I'm very deeply compassionate and kind. And those skills attracted other people to me. So I'm working on refugee issues. I think this is how I'm going to end my career. And I got called to go to uh, work in the Africa Bureau after I'd left the Africa Bureau when it was very, uh, uh, very early in my career. And I got called back to the Africa Bureau as a deputy assistant secretary. And when the assistant secretary interviewed me, she told me that she talked to three people separately who recommended me. And all three of them referred to me not only as hardworking, but kind. And so that's my specialty. And that specialty helped me to pursue the general things that I ended up doing that eventually led to me being an ambassador uh, and then the assistant secretary of state. Uh, Mark Storella from IST. Hi, Mark. Linda, uh, it is alarming to hear what you've said about how many people um, are concerned about the service, about backsliding and the way we're treating people and considering leaving. Is there anything that you would suggest uh, uh, informally for senior officers that we can do better uh, to turn this around? And anything maybe formally that we as an institution could do in terms of the way we train people to be more effective in retaining uh, talent uh, amongst our diverse population? Well, first, I, I think we have to be available uh, because, uh, unfortunately, I think the State Department was uh, effectively decapitated uh, over the, the past two years. And so there are not as many senior people or people who have been 
uh, mentors and supporters of uh, uh, the generation below us. They're, we're not there anymore, but we're in town. And so we need to make ourselves available. And that's why I, I do keep kind of a place on my calendar uh, for those kinds of appointments so that I can talk to people, I can encourage them, I can support them and, and push them forward. I may have mentioned I went to the department for a very short stint uh, about uh, six months ago, and I ended up being totally devastated by the number of people who uh, were pulling me uh, in the hallway to say how miserable uh, they were. And uh, I felt that I had a, a responsibility to buoy them up and not to encourage them to leave because I don't want to see people leave. I want uh, good people to stay. Uh, and um, so I felt it, it was important to make myself available now that I'm not in the, in the department uh, to encourage people uh, on that front. And then I think we have to engage with the... Uh, the, with APSA, the American Foreign Service uh, Association. Uh, we have to engage with members of Congress who are looking at how uh, the State Department is uh, being uh, treated and encourage them to take an interest in ensuring that, um, that we survive uh, this onslaught. And that has been, uh, I, th I think that has been one of the areas where I have been very focused and I think other senior officers have been focused and will continue to uh, work to promote the State Department, advocate for the State Department, advocate for professional uh, careers in the Foreign Service. Hi, Jim Severs from ISD. Uh, thank you, Linda. Could you say a little bit more about your thinking about work-life balance, um, a professional couple with young children, institution like the State Department or other institutions that are you know, some of the more interesting places to work, um, and sometimes the focus of the institution is a lot more on the work than the life, mm -hmm. and there's you know, huge pressure uh, to, let's say, be at the office all the time. Or th how, how, how did you deal with that, and how do you think young people should deal with that? You know, I, I think part of the problem is we expect the State Department to give us work-life balance. And the State Department is all about the work part. And if it's really, if, if you're really lucky, you might have a, a supervisor or a head of HR who thinks it's important that you have work-life balance. But ultimately, individuals have to be responsible for their work-life balance and demand it. Uh, from the State Department. Uh, my own approach, uh, as I moved up in, in my own career and I was married with children very, very early, uh, was that my children came first and I wasn't embarrassed by it. Uh, I had no problems saying that I can't take that assignment because I can't take my children there or there's no school for my children. Uh, it was not an option for me uh, to put an eight-year-old in boarding school, which I had, uh, I, I know of one, at least one colleague uh, who made that uh, very, very tough decision. Uh, so I chose assignments that met my priority, which is that I stay with my kids. And then the second priority, because I was a tandem, both my husband and I were in the Foreign Service, that we had assignments together. Ultimately, it worked out perfectly for us because we ended up going to places that nobody else wanted to go, that there happened to be a school. So we didn't have people jumping through hoops to go to Lagos, Nigeria in the mid 80s. Uh, we actually didn't have people jumping through hoops to go uh, to uh, Banjul, uh, where we were assigned when both of our kids were little. Uh, we came back to Washington for uh, four years uh, at, at one point so that we could uh, ensure that we were assigned together. Uh, I ended up going luckily to, uh, to Kenya where we did have people jumping through hoops to go through to Kenya, but they, they weren't refugee officers. Uh, and I had that skill, that specialized skill that you talked about. So I was able to get this assignment in a place where people would uh, cut off their arms to go to. Uh, but I got it because I had the specialized skills. And then it happened to be a place where there was a position uh, for my husband and a great school for my, for my kids. 
Uh, similarly, I ended up going to Pakistan. And you know, when people hear that I served in Pakistan, they look at me and you're an Africanist, you're an assistant secretary for Africa. How did you end up in Pakistan? I was a refugee coordinator. And there was a job there for my, uh, uh, my spouse and a school for the kids. Uh, so those were kind of my three goals in one, and it gave me work-life balance. And I liked the refugee work because even though you're dealing with hard uh, uh, situations, it was pretty much a bureau that was very family-friendly. Mark can, can tell you that. And so I wanted to stay in this bureau because I knew it was family-friendly, even though I was being told that I would never get promoted. Uh, my career would be over if I took one more refugee assignment. I had five. Um, and you know, this is going to be your, 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 this is your last assignment as a refugee officer. And I'd push and take one more. Uh, and it never hurt my career. And I was in a bureau that respected, uh, work-life balance. Uh, but I made the choice. Uh, so you do have to make that choice. When I was, uh, ambassador to Liberia, uh, I walked out of my office the first week at 5.30 and everybody looked at me and said, you're going home? And I said, yes, is there something you need me for? Uh, and, and the whole office was full. And, and I said, I, I live on the compound. Uh, if it's unclassified, I have a computer at home. Otherwise, call me, I'll come back to work. So eventually, everybody started going home early. Uh, because if I stayed at the office until eight o'clock at night, half the staff would stay at the office until eight o'clock at night. When I was assistant secretary for the Africa Bureau, actually when I was principal deputy assistant secretary for the Africa Bureau, when I started in the bureau, we would have DAS meetings at nine o'clock at night. And every staff assistant, the desk officers, everybody was staying because they knew the front office was there. When I became PDAS, I changed it all. I decided that anything that needed to go on the assistant secretary's desk unless it was an emergency, needed to be on her desk by six. And nothing else could go other than an emergency on her desk at six. And I literally escorted her out of the office by 7.30. Now that was still late, but it wasn't 11.30, which is what was, was happening uh, before. Uh, and it was hard for people to adjust to that because they had gotten used to they, getting that FaceTime running up to the front office at 8.30 at night. Uh, and then suddenly there was no front office. Uh, technology makes it easier. If you need your assistant secretary, you can pick up the phone and call her. You can send her an email. Uh, you can FaceTime now. Uh, you can do whatever you need to make contact uh, without having people sit in the office uh, all night long. Now, there will be times when you'll have to do that. When I was in PRM, uh, this office is very family friendly. We had an emergency. Charles Taylor invaded uh, Liberia on Christmas Eve. Guess what Linda was doing with her two little kids on Christmas Day? I was in the office. I knew I had to do it. I knew it was important. Uh, it was part of my work-life balance. Uh, because when it wasn't important for me to be in the office, nobody expected me to be there. And I could devote the time I needed to be uh, the mother I needed to be. Hi, my name is Musna. I'm um, kind of going off the work-life balance question. Um, how did you kind of separate yourself from the work, just even like on a mental health level is what I'm really kind of getting at, um, especially within the State Department institutions. Are there resources and um, things that they help with to kind of deal with the things that you have to see? You know, and there were, deal with? not when I was, uh, not early in my career, there were no resources there. You, you kind of had to make it up yourself. There are resources in the department now that are available to individuals to help them deal with some of the stresses of, of work. Uh, there are mentoring programs. People are assigned mentors. Uh, in the early stages, somebody had to kind of grab you and decide that they were going to mentor you or you'd have to kind of beg this person to, to, to mentor you. Now there are formal mentoring programs and people are encouraged to seek uh, mentors and to talk to uh, people who can give them advice. There are resources in HR 
uh, that will support efforts of employees to, to figure out how to uh, balance their, their work against uh, their uh, personal needs. Uh, there are mental health uh, resources in the department as well through the medical unit, and people use them. So there are lots of, of tools out there to support people, but ultimately it's going to be, and, and a lot of people disagree with me on this, it's, it has to come from you. You have to want the work-life balance. You have to be prepared to make the tough decisions. You have to be prepared to say no. So when I was asked to be the staff assistant to the DG at Perkins, I said no. Uh, I have two kids at home and I live 35 miles from DC. I can't take a job that will require me to work until eight o'clock at night. And he looked at me and he's still my mentor and he's still a wonderful person. And says, don't worry, you should be able to get out of here every night at six. And I believed him. Uh, <laughs> I never got out of there at six. Uh, fortunately, I had the other side of the work-life balance. I had a spouse who was willing to uh, fill up uh, the slack and take on the responsibilities that I, I couldn't take, take on. But everybody doesn't have that other side. Hi, Megan Kelly, former Rusk. And, and a conversation with Ed Perkins and, is what started me uh, on the state department yeah. journey, so very yeah. interesting. But um, I'm curious, Linda, on your thoughts, uh, diversity in our senior foreign service sort of in general. Does the department have uh, the right approach? Uh, I think we had the right approach. Uh, I'm not sure that exists uh, today uh, for there to be noticeable diversity at the senior ranks of the State Department. Uh, it has to be determined. It has to be committed. And people have to make the decision to do it. Uh, it was no fluke when I was Assistant Secretary for Africa that the Africa Bureau had the most diversity of any bureau in the State Department. Uh, it was. It, it was dedicated work on the part of me and my staff to ensure that. And without that dedication, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Uh, and it also has to come from everyone. I don't want to be the black woman at the top of the State Department making sure that, that minorities and women are put in senior positions. It has to be everybody. It has to come across the board. I don't want to walk in a room, uh, and I used to tell my people all the time, I don't want to walk in a room uh, that is the State Department senior uh, uh, department, and we're all black women. And no white man should want to walk in the room and have only white men in the room. So if I walked in the room and there were only black women, I'm going to do everything I can to build diversity into that. And I want my white male colleagues, when they walk in the room and there are only white men in the room, to see what is wrong with that room and start building diversity into, uh, into their operations as well. Uh, and I don't think that's happening right now in, in the department. And as the decapitation started to happen, uh, I, I was asked early on if I thought the decapitation d was directed at me because I was a black woman, and I didn't think that. Uh, I think it was very just surgical, just lop out the head and not realizing that as you lopped off that head, what you were left with was the State Department of the 1970s. Uh, nobody paid attention to what was happening. And now we're paying attention and it's too late. Phil Goldberg from ISD. Uh, to get to seniors, you have to have juniors. So let me ask you the perennial question, which is how do you recruit uh, a diverse workforce? Uh, how do you make the State Department an attractive career, especially for people? I know you evangelize and, and go out and, and try, but uh, how is that done now? You know, you have to do, you, you have to be proactive. And I think actually we are very proactive at that level, in, at the recruitment level. So we're bringing in uh, more diversity at the entry level uh, into the State Department. If you look at some of our classes, you, you see that. Um, the problem is 
maintaining and sustaining those people in the Foreign Service. Uh, you want them to be part of it. You want uh, diverse people, women and minorities and LGBT, to feel like they are appreciated uh, in the department and that they are not being discriminated against because of who, who they are. And it's fine if uh, a young uh, woman comes to me to say I'm being discriminated against because I'm a woman and I help her. What I need to make it work for her is for you to help her. She has to know that it's not just because I'm a woman and she's a woman, I'm willing to jump through hoops for her. She has to believe that the Department of State will jump through hoops for her and ensure that she stays in, in the department. And, and so I, it's at that next level that I think we're, we're failing. We get them in, we, we can't keep them. Uh, we have programs like the Pickering and the Wrangell uh, program. And then we have the proactive recruiting that not just uh, I did, but we have a whole recruitment office that actually focuses on recruiting for diversity. But there's not an office that focuses on maintaining for diversity. Since you referenced the Pickering program and the intake, um, I know that we have a couple uh, Pickering fellows and Wrangell fellows in the room as well as aspiring uh, Foreign Service officers. Any other questions? Ambassador, thank you for being here today. My name is Charlie Baynard, and I'm a second year MSFS student. I'm going to take the orals uh, in a month, and my wife okay. is currently a first tour officer in Monterey. So I wanted to go back to the family, not necessarily work life balance, but particularly with you and your husband as a tandem couple. How did you balance each other's professional goals and desire to advance in the service with each other's careers? Communication. Uh, it's, uh, it's the most important thing a tandem couple uh, can do. And sometimes you're going to have to make tough decisions to downplay your own ambitions for your spouse's uh, ambitions. Uh, because both of you, and we, we do have some cases where there are superstar couples in the State Department, but it's rare that there are superstar couples uh, because you can't do it and stay together. And as I look at some of the superstar couples, they were never assigned together. They spent a lot of time apart. So if you want to uh, have a successful uh, relationship, sometimes you have to play down your career uh, aspirations. And my husband and I did that on a regular basis. Now, the truth of the matter is it didn't hurt either one of us. Uh, I uh, retired as, as a CM, uh, the uh, most senior before you go into career ambassador. And my husband was on the technical side and he retired as an 01. Uh, and that was, uh, for both of us, very respectable uh, in, in, in our careers. But we both took jobs that were below our aspirations on occasions. So my husband, when we went to Geneva, Switzerland, was an 01 in an 03 job. Uh, and most young people in the Foreign Service and older people will never take a two grade downstretch. And his view was, I've made it to an 01, who cares if I'm in an 03 position? And then he made that 03 position uh, into an 01 position. And when he got ready to leave and suddenly people learned that it was, they were recruiting 03s, uh, they were upset and they upgraded the position. But it never bothered him that he was in a position that was a two grade downstretch. Uh, I did a one grade downstretch uh, for an entire assignment. And in that one grade downstretch, I got promoted to the next grade. So I was suddenly, at the end of it, I was in a two grade downstretch. Uh, but I got promoted in the downstretch job uh, because I made the decision that the most important thing for me was to be in the same place that my husband was in with my children. And you tend, when you make those decisions and you know that you're doing a job, you try to do your best. So I'm not going to not do my best because I'm two grades above the job. I'm going to do my best uh, because I want to be in that particular job because it met goals that I had. Uh, we, when I was Director General of the Foreign Service, we had a young tandem couple. In fact, the, the 
the one of the employees was in the service, was in Chinese training, had been in Chinese training for a year, was getting ready to go into the second year of Chinese training, and his spouse came in. She was a Spanish speaker. There were China positions on the list that she could have bidded on to ensure that they got assigned together, but she bidded on a Latin America job, and he wanted to break his assignment in, after he'd done one year of Chinese training, getting ready to go into the second year. He wanted to break his assignment so that he could go to Latin America with his spouse. It doesn't work. Uh, the system wouldn't bend enough for that to happen. Uh, and when I met with them, I said, th th there was an easy fix for you. There were seven positions in China that you could have bid on. Uh, why didn't you bid on the positions in China? Well, she was more concerned about doing what she wanted to do and so the system didn't work. She came into the Foreign Service and he actually quit. Uh, and it was our loss. It really was our loss uh, that, uh, that this person uh, quit the Foreign Service. But sometimes you have to be, in addition to the system having to be flexible, employees have to also show some flexibility. So I would encourage you to show flexibility. Sit down with your, uh, uh, with your wife every time there's an assignment and decide whether that place works for the two of you and why it works. And sometimes her career is going to take precedent over yours. And there are other times that yours might take precedent. And what that will mean is that your uh, progression will probably be a little bit slower than the progression of a colleague that doesn't have to take into account a spouse's career. But ultimately, in the end, you're going to end up in the same place as the person who doesn't have to take that. Uh, I use uh, Ambassador Bill, Bill Burns as an example. Bill and I came into uh, the Foreign Service together with his wife. So the three of us were in the same Foreign Service class. She made the decision at the O1 level to leave the Foreign Service and allow him to pursue his career. And we all thank her for that because otherwise we might not have had the Bill Burns that we have today. Um, Bill went to the top like this. I went to the top like that. We both ended up in the same place. He just got there faster than, than I got there because he didn't uh, have to take all those things into account that I needed to, to take into, into account. But we both ended up uh, at uh, a very high place. I didn't make it to deputy secretary, uh, but that wasn't in the cards. But if you watch Madam Secretary, uh, the TV show, the Assistant Secretary for Africa two weeks ago was named Deputy Secretary of State, and that character was developed for me. So wow. I feel like I made it. <laughs> I love it. Well, what other questions do you have? Yeah. Hi, Bianca Kemp from ISD. Um, before you said that two of your strong suits are kindness and compassion, mm -hmm. and to that I would add humility. Mm -hmm. How have you maintained those characteristics throughout your career with the tough assignments that you've had? It's kind of in my psyche as well. Uh, I'm always reminded not to forget uh, where I came from. And if you don't forget where you came, you are always humble. And so I'm very, uh, it's, it was the way I was raised, but I'm very conscious that uh, I, where I came from and that it's not kind of written in the cards that a person starting here would end up where I ended up. And I remind myself of that every, every single day. Um, so, um Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, I know you've mentioned in the past that a representative foreign service is one that really represents the United States. And in that sense, America has just a very rich regional difference. Do you think that there's an adequate regional representation from all the different regions in the foreign service? I think we've done a better job of that than, uh, than most people recognize. When, we first, when I first came into the foreign service, everybody was from the East Coast. And it was a rarity that you would have uh, people from the South. I don't think I've ever been in a post yet where, where I've not met uh, other people from Louisiana. Uh, 
but I also meet people from across the uh, United States. And our recruitment efforts have, have contributed to that. We have diplomats in residence and diplomats who've retired who go to places like Oklahoma. Uh, we have, so that's why we have Megan in the Foreign Service. Uh, when I was in South Bend uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we have a diplomat, a former State Department person there. And so we make a concerted effort to get outside the beltway, to get off the eastern seaboard and move as far west as, as we can. So I think on, from that front, we've been extraordinarily uh, successful and I think it's something we should be proud of. I really want to ask on behalf of the Pickerings and the, some of the students who are aspiring um, to careers in the Foreign Service and starting their careers in the Foreign Service, what advice might you give them at this juncture in our, in our history? You know, my, uh, the advice I give to everybody, not just because it's where we are in, in our history, is have fun. Uh, this is an amazing career. I have never regretted any single day, even the tough days as I look back. I have absolutely no regrets. I have made a, a concerted effort to make friends wherever I've gone and to be the, the greatest representative of the United States that I can be wherever I am. And if you're able to do that and have fun, you're gonna have an amazing career. So enjoy yourself. I would just love to continue this conversation <laughs> the entire <laughs> afternoon. Um, I realize you've taken a lot of your time very generously. So thank you so much. I hope um, we all uh, really appreciated your sharing your really candid insights and perspectives. I particularly appreciate the open door that you gave to those who might be encountering um, any questions along the way. So thank you so much. Good. Thank you very much and best of luck to all of you who are looking to foreign service careers. You won't regret it. <laughs>